Live from CNN Atlanta, this is Connect the World. Connecting the world tonight, the unprecedented global crisis that we are all feeling in every part of our lives. Welcome to the show. I'm Linda King. Hey, good to have you with us. I'm sitting in for Becky Anderson. Well, the biggest challenge since the Second World War, those words usually from a very stoic German Chancellor Angela Merkel, letting the world know that she is worried. And this comes, of course, as the economic and the social shutdown from the coronavirus crisis is deepening across the globe. Hopes of containing this spread now hinge on governments and citizens deciding that, effectively, we are all in this together. And, of course, it is a lot more than a slogan. So here's what we know right now. We have developing and really shocking news out of Iran. Health officials there say one Iranian is dying every 10 minutes from COVID-19. And at least 50 are infected every single hour. We also have a major development coming out of India. The government there suspending international commercial flights for a week. That's set to start on Sunday. And turning to Europe, Italy has seen its deadliest day. 475 people died from infections on Wednesday. In Germany, the number of cases spiked by, by more than 2,800 over the last 24 hours. Economists say fighting the outbreak is pushing the country into recession. Well, confirmed cases worldwide have now passed 200,000 people, while more than 9,000 have died. That information coming to us from the World Health Organization. Our reporters across the globe are ready to bring you the latest information we know. Our Bobby Nadeau is standing by in Rome, and our Fred Plattin uh, is covering all the developments on Iran from Berlin. I want to start with you first, Fred, because this is pretty dire new data coming from Iran's health ministry mm. saying that essentially one Iranian is dying from the coronavirus every 10 minutes. Yeah, Linda, you're absolutely right. And the, and the uh, coronavirus certainly has been really ravaging Iran over the past uh, couple of weeks. And we've been seeing uh, that really taking place as the numbers continue to rise. And as you mentioned, he said one Iranian dies every 10 minutes. About 50 are confirmed as uh, infected uh, every single hour. So you can see how that outbreak is continuing and is continuing to spike. One of the interesting things that we've been seeing over the past couple of days is the number of new infections we've been looking at that from the data have been well over a thousand every single day and of course the death toll has been rising uh, to a, a great extent as well over the past couple of days well over a hundred pretty much each and every day in fact the data that we got uh, from today this is from uh, just a couple of hours ago is 149 new infected is what the iranians have announced today and of course that is a number that continues to rise so a very difficult situation there for the iranians and it really is several things that are coming together there linda on the one hand of course they are having a lot of trouble containing the disease they're having a lot of trouble uh, to stop it from spreading but then also the medical sector in iran has been in a lot of trouble for a very long period of time and the iranians are saying this comes in the form of the foreign minister this also comes in the form uh, of the iranian president hassan rouhani is that international sanctions uh, led by the united states of course have taken a uh, a big toll on Iran's health sector over the past couple of, of years. I've seen this firsthand uh, when, when I was in Iran. In general, the health sector there is ailing uh, uh, to a great degree. And the thing about the Iranian health sector is that there are no sanctions directly on medical goods, but hospitals and other institutions have a lot of trouble getting the medical goods that they need. Not only talk about medication, but also, for instance, spare parts for a lot of the machines uh, that the Iranians lead. Like, for instance, ventilators, which of course now uh, are something that are very difficult uh, to come by and something that are very important in combating uh, the coronavirus outbreak there uh, in Iran. And the Iranians are saying the big problem is that a lot of international medical companies are not willing to do business with Iran because they're afraid that they're going to get punished by the United States and then of course payments are also a big problem to Iran as well as Iran is essentially or is completely cut off from the system of international electronic payments so very very difficult for them to get their hands 
on the equipment they need to get their hands on the spare parts for the equipment uh, that they need to utilize and then also getting medication as well. So very difficult for Iran's medical sector, very difficult also for the society to try and keep the disease from spreading. And, and, and just one final word, uh, Linda, one of the things, of course, that's coming up uh, in the night uh, uh, into tomorrow is, of course, uh, the Persian New Year, which is Iran's major celebration every year. And usually when people travel a lot, that is probably or, or most definitely not going to take place as massive travel restrictions are in place uh, in Iran to prevent people from moving around to try and somehow slow down the disease that's having such a devastating effect uh, that we've been seeing there in those numbers, Linda. Yeah, I can't imagine that will go ahead, Fred. Uh, and it seems those sanctions are still really crippling Iran's efforts uh, to control and contain this pandemic. Uh, thanks to you, I want to bring in Bobby Nadeau on Italy. And obviously we are seeing the deaths rising rapidly. We've been speaking now daily and every single day we've been seeing cases jump from t by 200, by 250. And now uh, the largest dump, 475 in one day. Uh, just explain the situation there right now. How dire is it? You know, it is terribly dire here, Linda. You know, the, the lockdown continues. People are seeing the numbers rising. And, I, you know, that makes you wonder how long the lockdown is going to last. We've been hearing from hints from government uh, officials that they're considering, you know, if they can really lift this lockdown April 3rd. Nobody thinks that's really likely, given the fact that the numbers are so great. And it's taking an everyday toll on Italians who live here. 60 million people under lockdown to go out to get groceries, to walk their dog. And it's just, it really takes its toll. I think on the psyche everybody was thinking oh we can do this for a few weeks it'll be over it the numbers will start to go down and then we can get on with our lives but the law the more these numbers rise the longer this lasts the harder it is for everyday Italians Linda and just give us a sense Bobby of why it's hit, hitting Italy so badly because we are hearing that this is the worst national crisis facing Italy since World War II yeah, you know, I mean, that is, of course, the big question. One of the answers everybody says in terms of the death toll is because there's just such an older population here. That's because the lifestyle is good. That's because people live longer. And those are the people that are the first, of course, to succumb to the coronavirus. Now, we're so, so many of these people have underlying conditions, have different two, three pathologies, uh, and that makes them weak and vulnerable as well. But one of the issues with the lockdown is that there's still lots of reports that people aren't following it. You know, there are reports that are people are walking on the beach or that are still meeting up in, in some smaller towns. And until everybody complies with the lockdown, the virus will continue to spread. And we're understanding that this weekend we're going to see even harsher measures. Already we're seeing what stores are open are going to be closing a little bit earlier. That's to try to get people off the streets. And we've seen police around all these neighborhoods uh, trying to get people to go inside. If you're out you know, walking your dog, fine. But if you're out with your kids, get back inside is the message. And stay there until this crisis is over. Linda? And Bobby, just give us a sense of how hospitals are coping with this, the caseload, because I understand there are field hospitals in play right now. How are they handling this? Well, they're under extreme pressure. You've got doctors uh, and nurses and other healthcare workers actually coming down with uh, COVID-19. And that, of course, puts even more strain on the system. They don't have enough respirators, you know, beds. They're, they're getting some donations from NGOs and things like that with the field hospitals. But as soon as they get new beds and are able to put up new ICU wards, you know, they're filled right away. It's, it's really, really hard on the health care system. Uh, the government asked yesterday that all retired doctors and nurses come back into service. They need everyone they can on the front line to, to treat the people who, uh, who are coming down with the virus or who are, you know, getting it. And they need the people of the, every single city across this country to do their part. And the government's message has been just, if you just stay tough and stay inside and keep up this lockdown, maybe we'll get to the end of this sooner than later. Linda? All right. Bobby Nadeau for us in Rome. Our Frederick Platten in Berlin. Good to have you both with us. Thank you. Well, here in the United States, the coronavirus crisis is escalating and rapidly. Nationwide, the number of cases jumped by 40% in just 24 hours. Some hospitals say they're going to run out of crucial supplies in days, not weeks. And the economic impact seems to be getting scarier by the day. Our Bryn Gingras reports. 
President Trump signing a new coronavirus aid package into law after weeks of downplaying the scope of the pandemic. It's the invisible enemy. That's always the toughest enemy, the invisible enemy, but we're going to defeat the invisible enemy. The U.S. Navy deploying two hospital ships, one heading to New York City, where the mayor says there's a dire need for additional medical support. We're almost uh, to 2,000 cases right now in New York City alone. Uh, that's going to cause a surge into our hospitals. They are going to be using up their supplies rapidly in an unprecedented manner. New York's governor insists he prefer to avoid an order to shelter in place. We went to 50 percent of the workforce today. Obviously, the flip side is the more you close down businesses, the worse on the economy and on individual incomes. But nearly 10 million Northern Californians are experiencing just that, asked to only leave home for necessary activities like buying groceries. Well, the people in San Francisco are definitely permitted to go out, to run, to exercise, to ride bikes. So many of our residents are complying with this order because they understand its impact on public health. This is about public health. This is not a vacation. But in Florida, some beaches are still packed with young people celebrating spring break, ignoring calls to practice social distancing. New CDC data shows adults between the ages of 20 and 54 make up nearly 40 percent of people needing to be hospitalized because of coronavirus. Officials begging young people to take precautions. There are concerning reports coming out of France and Italy about some young people getting seriously ill and very seriously ill in the ICUs. We cannot have these large gatherings that continue to occur throughout the country for people who are off work to then be socializing in large groups and spreading the virus. You have the potential then to spread it to someone who does have a condition that none of us knew about and cause them to have a disastrous outcome. President Trump disagreeing with his Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, who warned the country could see a 20 percent unemployment rate because of coronavirus if there's no intervention. No, I don't agree. That's a absolute total worst case scenario. Meantime, many people already feeling the sting of the pandemic in their pockets. The Trump administration and Capitol Hill are working on ways to help, including a $1 trillion stimulus package with up to $500 billion in checks into the hands of some Americans, a $50 billion bailout for the airline industry, and up to $300 billion to support small businesses. We have to help everybody. It was nobody's fault. Well, for the first time since the pandemic began, Hubei province, China's epicenter of this pandemic, reported zero new cases on Wednesday. CNN's David Culver reports. Linda, these numbers are certainly significant. Uh, they come from the National Health Commission, so you've got to consider the source in all of this, and that's the Chinese government. But we should point out that the World Health Organization has relied heavily on these numbers, and so have other nations, including President Trump was asked about the data and his trusting of it, and he says it's been helpful in how the U.S. has addressed their handling of this outbreak. However, the numbers are not allowing folks here to breathe easy. And that is to say, while there are no new reported cases at the local transmission level, uh, certainly within Hubei province and within all of mainland China, there are 34 new imported cases. What does that mean? Well, it means China is now shifting their concern to an external threat from this outbreak. They're worried about folks traveling into mainland China and bringing with them the virus and potentially exposing others. So what are they doing to prevent that or at least to try to mitigate that threat? Within Beijing's capital airport, they are focused on intense screening and evaluation of all international travelers, meaning if you're traveling into China from any other country, you're going to be spending 14 days in a government-designated quarantine facility. It is mandatory, and it is something that they believe will help reduce the risk uh, as this outbreak is continuing to be a threat, uh, certainly to other countries. And here within China, they're also doing something that's rather interesting. I mean, when you look at uh, the fact that there are less and less cases, fewer and fewer numbers, um, you wonder why they would be increasing hospital capacity. Well, the World Health Organization says that China's doing that in a strategic manner so as to prepare for a potential second wave if that were to come, whether it be from imported cases or from the easing of the lockdown restrictions. You've got to remember, within Wuhan, the epicenter of all of this, we're now going on eight weeks that people have been under lockdown, and uh, many of those weeks has, has been essentially 
uh, folks sealed inside their homes, not able to leave, basic necessities coming to them. It's a very difficult situation for them, but the government believes that has been incredibly effective in stopping the spread of this virus, certainly without, uh, with, without uh, getting into most of other parts of mainland China, which was really their concern. It's been kind of concentrated in Hubei province and its capital, Wuhan. Now, when do they anticipate to start easing some of those restrictions? Wuhan health officials have said that's not gonna happen until they have hit 14 straight days of no new reported cases. So if this was day one, it would be another 13 days, assuming that between now and day 14, not a single case pops up within the city of Wuhan. Only then will health officials consider easing some of the lockdown restrictions and allowing folks to resume life. China at this point seems to be um, at least content with where the numbers are, but not breathing easy. Linda. Well, thanks to David Culver there. Well, investors are seeing red right across the globe. We're going to look for any silver lining to this very dark financial cloud coming up. Also, we're going to speak to an American stranded in Peru after the country closed its borders to stop the spread of the virus.